guys. Today we're going to take a look at water and its importance in biology. We're going to also look at hydrogen bonding and we'll then apply it to the idea of pH. So I actually want to hit the hydrogen bonding first and let's go ahead and define that. It says hydrogen bonds are the attraction between hydrogen atoms and the lone pairs of either nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. So those three elements are the most electronegative elements on the periodic table. They're found in the upper right. They're close to having their octets full. So they're looking for a few more electrons in order to get that stable octet we were talking about, eight electrons in an outer shell. So those particular atoms will be happy at that point. Now, what we're talking about here is a hydrogen bond, hydrogen bonding with one of these, nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. And they can be part of a molecule. So why this attraction occurs is because there's a big difference in the amount of electronegativity or how bad these particular elements want electrons. We just said nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine want electrons real bad. And that is what we call an atom's electronegativity. And you can actually find it in the bottom right hand corner of a periodic table box. Now hydrogen it doesn't really want electrons as bad, not nearly as bad as those three. If you look at its electronegativity, it's 2.1. The electronegativity scale goes from 0 to 4.0. So hydrogen is somewhere in the middle because it's kind of stable if it gets one, but it would rather just kind of give up the one or at least share the one it's with in order to achieve stability. So in the case of um, hydrogen and these elements, it's going to share with these and therefore it's going to get its second electron to be stable and nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine, they're also going to get the electron or electrons that they need to become stable. So let's take a look at a few examples of how hydrogen bonding works. And if you look down here, um, we have a water molecule right here, and we learned how this water molecule comes together by way of covalent bonding. And what happens when you covalently bond an oxygen to hydrogens is you wind up with two lone pairs of electrons that are hanging off of the oxygen atom. Now, what that means is that there's going to be a larger negative charge on this atom than there are on the hydrogens because oxygen has all this pulling power. It's pulling two more electrons towards itself in order to become stable. So what that does is it gives oxygen a negative charge. Meanwhile, the hydrogens each have their own little positive charge because their electrons are getting pulled from them. And if you have negativity taken away from you, you become more positive. So let's just imagine that another water molecule is floating towards this one the way it's situated. And we'll say that uh, here's the hydrogen of the next one, and there's the other hydrogen, and there's the oxygen. So the question is, how would it float in? How would it um, behave itself in relation to this molecule here? Well, as we just said, the hydrogens are positive and the oxygens are negative. So would we expect this oxygen to float around this way and be attracted to that oxygen? Of course not, because two negatives would not attract each other. If you put the two wrong ends of a magnet together, they don't attract each other, they repel each other. And that's what happens in the case of when we have a oxygen and an oxygen coming together. They will repel each other based on the charges they have when they are a part of water, because water is a polar molecule. Instead, what we're going to see is we're going to see that H is attracted to the oxygen, because H is a positively charged end of the molecule. And here is our negative end of this one. So what we have then is we have this um, attraction between the negative pole of this water and the positive pole of that water. And that is where we would form our little hydrogen bond. So this right here would be a connection. Now it's not going to link solid strong um, for the most part if it's in a liquid form. Instead it's going to be a momentary attraction that's pretty strong. Enough for it to hold together until it's bumped loose again. Ammonia kind of has that same ability except this one has one of the other atoms we were talking about, uh, one of the other elements, and it's nitrogen. So on this one here, again, the electrons are going to be pulled towards your more electronegative nitrogen, and they're being pulled from the hydrogen. So that makes a little positive charge on this hydrogen, 
this one and this one and the negative pole is going to be right there. So if another ammonia molecule passes by and one of the hydrogens, let's go ahead and draw it out again here. Whoops. There we go. That's the proper placement of it. Don't worry about that, H. Here we go. Um, since all of these hydrogens are posi uh, positively charged, one may brush by this ammonia here, and what we'll find is that the H that's positively charged is going to be attracted to the negatively charged ammonia on this one. So this nitrogen here also has a negative charge, and you might have a different molecule brush by and for a moment be attracted, um, and H would be attracted to that end. And here's hydrofluoric acid, uh, and I think we can predict which end is more um, negative and which end is positive because of all of these electrons around fluorine. That's our negative end, and this is our positive end. So an H would be highly attracted to the fluorine. So again, hydrogen bonds is when hydrogen is attracted to a very electronegative atom such as nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. Um, one thing I wanted to note here um, as well is that in our last talk, we mentioned ionic bonds and covalent bonds. And those were the bonds found within, say, molecules for covalent compounds or within formula units or crystals of an ionic compound. So those hold an actual compound together. Um, however, when we talk about hydrogen bonding, we're talking about intermolecular forces. The forces between one molecule and another molecule, and are they attracted to each other or not? So that's the difference um, when we talk about hydrogen bonding. It's a different type of force. It's intermolecular, where ionic and covalent were intramolecular. Sounds the same, but it has a different concept, different meaning. Okay, so we're going to take a look at water again, and water has the ability to hydrogen bond because, as we said, oxygen is one of those atoms that hydrogen is attracted to. So in this picture here, we can see that the H, which is positively charged on this water, is attracted to the negative charge on that one, and that is where your hydrogen bond exists at. So we could take a look at a couple other things here. Here you can clearly see by way of the dotted lines that these H's and those O's are connected by way of hydrogen bonds. We can also look at it like this. And this is a very interesting uh, picture of water because they all seem to be oriented in the same general uh, structure. There's a lot of order, very... Um, um, uh, you can see that there's levels and layers and everything seems to be orient orientated in the right same direction. And that is what we see when we talk about ice. So to answer the question at the bottom, what state of matter is water in here? That's ice. And hydrogen bonds of ice are actually a little bit further than those of liquid. So they're a little bit spread apart, um, which has to do with some uh, characteristics that ice have, um, such as being less dense than liquid water, which is why ice floats on water instead of sinks. Um, the next thing I wanted you to look at here was the interactions that liquid water molecules have. Now what we got to imagine here is that there are um, hydrogen bonds going on in here, but they are very momentary. They're very brief. Um, we're talking on the order of milliseconds because in a liquid water sample, molecules are always on the move. They have kinetic energy because the temperature is higher than zero degrees Celsius, which means they're going to be moving. And they will very briefly interact with each other, stick for you know a millisecond, and then release again. So hydrogen bonds will continually break and reform. And if you want an idea of how water looks, if you could, you know, somehow shrink yourself down to some microscopic size and take a look at what they're doing, you would have a scenario something like this. So now we have a lot of water molecules all around you that are interacting. They're briefly hydrogen bonding with one another before they release and those hydrogen bonds break again. Okay, that's a little disorienting even watching that. So let's move on uh, to biologically important properties of water. And the first one that we're going to mention here, uh, we'll mention a few on this slide, is the ability to moderate temperature. And that's based on a concept called the specific heat capacity of water. Um, in our past lecture, we talked about the importance of 
uh, the values inside of biological organisms staying relatively stable. Think of temperature. You know, what happens when you get sick and your temperature starts going above 100, 101, 102? Um, when that happens, we are out of sync with what our steady state should be. We should be 98.6, and now that we're out of that important range of temperature values, of normal temperature values, bad things can happen. So we don't want our ability for the uh, temperature of our bodies to go up or down significantly, and what Water is the reason why it doesn't. We don't want to work out and have our temperature go up to 115 degrees because that would be disastrous for our health. So water is going to play a key part in uh, moderating temperature. Another, um, another idea that we can investigate that uh, has water as its basis is that it has a, a high versatility as a solvent. Um, when we learned about ionic crystals and ionic compounds, well, we technically don't have a whole lot of ionic compounds clunking around in our blood vessels and in our body. Instead, most of them are dissolved, but those ions that made up those crystals are very, very important. We have to have, again, narrow ranges of those ions that made up the ionic compounds, and we do, they just happen to be dissolved in solution. So it's versatility as a solvent, it's ability to dissolve all ionic compounds is really important. Our nervous system would shut down if we didn't have the right ions and the right concentrations. Evaporative cooling. Um, we are talking about working out and getting really hot. Well, we have a mechanism um, that's based on water that helps us alleviate the problems that would come with that, and that's called evaporating cooling, evaporative cooling, and we'll delve into that in a little bit as well. Um, and the last one that we... Uh, should mention um, is adhesion and cohesion. Uh, water happens to like itself a lot. You just saw that by way of the hydrogen bond. Water is attracted to itself. But we also see that water can be attracted to other things as well. For example, um, water loves glass. And that's one of the reasons why when you're measuring things in a graduated cylinder, you'll notice that there's a, a meniscus. There's a little U that forms at the surface of the liquid because water has a high affinity for glass. It really likes it. So down here in my simple little picture here, you can see that water likes itself. It's holding hands with itself. And here, water seems to like whatever this green substance is. So cohesion and adhesion play a really big part in plant biology, which we're going to get to later in our semester. Okay, so to truly understand specific heat capacity, which is the one we'll kind of delve into first, I want to give you some background ideas. Um, first of all, uh, typically in science, we tend to use the Celsius scale um, when we're doing any kind of scientific investigation. It's a measure of temperature using Celsius degrees. And then there's this idea of what we call a calorie. Now, we're all familiar with the word calorie because, you know, whenever you read an article about diets and, you know, people watching their calories, we tend to think, oh, calorie, we know what that is. But it, uh, the calorie that we're looking at here has a very highly scientific definition. And I also want you to notice that it has a, whoops, a lowercase c that starts off the word. So this is technically defined as the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of water one degree Celsius. Okay, so let's think about that. Let's think of a little tiny one centimeter cube of water. The amount of energy, amount of heat it would take to raise it one degree Celsius. And it wouldn't be a whole lot. Imagine how many grams that we weigh. You know, we're about 60 to 70 percent water. And uh, if we converted our pounds to grams, we would find a huge number of grams um, that our body actually weighs. So to change the temperature of one gram of water, one degrees, it's not a very big amount of heat. Um, when we hear the calorie version that has to do with diet and food, we're thinking of a big C calorie, uh, which we call a kilocalorie or kcal, where one kcal equals a thousand of those little ones. Because we have so many grams of water inside of us, and because we have a metabolism that runs, there's chemical reactions going on, and the byproducts of those chemical reactions is heat, we continually ingest calories, and that keeps our uh, body temp stable, and it keeps our metabolism, uh, metabolism running efficiently. Um, if you take a look at the real simple examples here of food and the amount of calories that they provide, 
you know, if I was starving, I probably wouldn't go looking for the broccoli if I was literally starving because the amount of calories are very low and the amount of fat is very low. And fat can be changed to working energy within uh, the human body as well. But if we take a look at the brownie, the amount of calories and fat is much, much higher. So if you ate one of these, what's going to happen is going to provide you with a lot more energy and it's going to produce a lot more heat internally. And that brings us to the definition of specific heat. The specific heat of a substance is the amount of heat that must be absorbed or lost for one gram of that substance to change its temperature by one degree. Now, if we're looking at water as that substance, um, water has a high value of specific heat. Right now, these numbers don't mean a lot to you. 4.184 kilojoules per gram times degree Celsius, or there's that cal again, one cal uh, per joule, uh, sorry, per gram, uh, uh, sorry, one calorie divided by grams uh, per degree Celsius. Now, let me put it in, in this manner. We'll use an example. I give this goofy example a lot here. Okay, let's say for some reason someone was forcing you to do a dumb thing, okay? They say you can either put your hand in a, in this case, tank of water and leave it there as somebody hits the surface of this water with a blowtorch for two minutes straight, okay? So heat is being added to this. So you have the choice of leaving your hand in this water or, on the other hand, um, they could hand you these metal tongs and they would heat up this horseshoe here for two minutes and you'd have to hold on to the metal tongs. Which one would you rather do? And most of the time my students get this right. They say, well, I'd rather put my hand in the water. Now, some don't. Some say I'd rather hold on to the, the metal tongs. Now the problem is metal transfers heat very, very well. So what's going to happen is the heat that's going on in the horseshoe is going to travel up the metal tongs and eventually hit your hand and burn your hand. Whereas water has different properties because if your hand was in here, it's a really bad hand, but that's okay. If your hand was in here, it would take a really long time for that blowtorch on the surface of the water to heat up this entire body of water. Water resists temperature change because it has a very high specific heat value. In fact, if you were to compare on a list, specific heat values of water versus metals, you're going to find that they're, the metals are way down on the list. It takes a lot less heat to heat them up. And that's why, you know, when you're cooking and you put your pan or your pot on top of the stovetop, the metal gets hot really fast. But if you're trying to boil water in that pot, the same amount of water and weight that the, the pot weighs, it takes a really long time to boil the water because water's resisting. It has a very high specific heat. And that specific heat can be traced to what we call hydrogen bonding. So the hydrogen bonding, which we mentioned earlier, um, works like this. If heat is going into this liquid water sample, it's going to take energy in order for these hydrogen bonds to break. So heat is absorbed when hydrogen bonds break. So what is going on if you're heating up this water? Well, eventually, if you keep the heat on it, it's going to go from this liquid state to the state of gas. If you add heat to a liquid, eventually it will reach a gas if the energy is high enough. So what's going to happen here are these hydrogen bonds, as the heat goes in, they're going to start to vibrate. And as they vibrate, these, these hydrogen bonds are going to start shaking and shaking. And eventually, there's going to be a point where they shake so much, they pop away from each other. They break the hydrogen bond. And then these are free to float away as um, not water molecules. But now we have H2O in the gas form. And they're going to fly away into the atmosphere of wherever whatever environment that you're in. So that is one of the reasons why the specific heat of water is so high because it takes energy to get these things shaking these hydrogen bonds so much they actually break and release into the environment okay i also want you to think of sweating okay so we mentioned that earlier in the first slide so this woman here is on a stationary bike and you can see there is sweat on her arm and 
if this sweat wasn't there, eventually she's going to overheat and most likely pass out. So we don't want our temp exceeding, um, really, we don't want it getting into the hundreds and staying there for long because bad things happen with proteins when they're not in their comfort range of temperatures. Um, but let's just talk about the, the sweat that's on her skin right here. Um, because it is liquid and because her body is warming up, what's going to happen is this liquid is going to evaporate from her skin. So if we have a water droplet here, we want it to evaporate and fly off into the environment. Now, what's going to get that to happen is the fact that she's heating up. So some of the heat that's in her body is going to go through blood vessels and it's going to enter into the water and therefore she's going to lose heat, thus becoming cooler, while the water is going to gain that heat. It's going to allow those water molecules to start shaking and start breaking and evaporate from her body. So the process of sweating is actually cooling her down because her body is transferring the weight from her blood, uh, transferring the heat from her blood into the water molecules that are on her surface, and then that's how she's losing the heat, and it goes into the again the bond the hydrogen bonds they start shaking they start breaking and then she becomes cooler on the flip side of that let's talk about why um steam burns are so bad so i want you to look at this statement here heat is released when hydrogen bonds form and steam is a super hot version of water vapor of of, of gas uh state water and imagine if you had 200 degrees celsius uh, water vapor steam that hits your skin. Now you are a colder object than that steam. Okay, you are at 37 degrees Celsius. So if the steam hits your skin, first of all, it's going to burn it just because of the pure temperature difference of 200 degrees Celsius. Your skin is at 37 or uh, slightly lower than that. But secondly, as that water vapor condenses on your skin, it's going to go from gas form into uh, liquid form and that requires energy heat will be released so not only we get burned from the temperature of steam but you get an additional deeper slower burn because that steam is now going to condense into water droplets on the skin and that will release energy as well and that will again make the burn even worse um, there's an additional phenomenon that happens um, usually during the coldest part of winter. Sometimes temps will dip down way low, even into as south as Florida. And they have to keep their produce growing during the winter season. And the farmers will sometimes fear a freeze. So what they will do, if they, if they get a weather report and they see that it may freeze where they could lose their citrus crops, is they'll go out and they'll actually spray water all over their citrus crops. And the reason they do that is because water is going to have a less chance of freezing and damaging the crops um, if it is on top of the fruit. Because for it to change from liquid water into ice, it's going to take a release of energy, which is going to actually heat up the fruit um, hopefully to the point where they actually don't start forming ice crystals on the inside. So it's a preventative measure from farmers to keep their crops safe. When you go from the liquid state to the solid state, there is a release of energy as well. And uh, that is what they do to prevent uh, uh, damage to their crops. So overall, then, the high specific heat of water minimizes temperature fluctuations within limits that permit life. So temperature must remain relatively stable in order for the organism to be safe. Um, here's just another view here of evaporation showing a sweat gland uh, secreting sweat. It's on the surface, and once again, the heat from the blood vessels is going to go into the, these liquid droplets, um, thus reducing the temperature of the living organism, and uh, the water droplets will then change into um, H2O gas particles, and they'll float away, and that's evaporative cooling. Okay, um, I also wanted to mention water and its relationship to pH. Um, with pH in mind, um, what we're talking about is the relative concentration of protons, which are also called hydrogen ions in water. 
So if this is water right here, we can see that water has the ability to separate into these ions, a hydrogen ion and what's called a hydroxide ion, OH negative. You put all three of these together and you get HOH. So water can what we call self ionize and it does so to a very small degree on its own. So what it looks like is this, here's our water molecule, the H separates off of it and now we have a proton or what we call a hydrogen ion right here. And pH is the relative concentration of hydrogen ions. So the more of these that are floating around in solution, the more acidic a solution tends to be. Um, so water has what we call an equilibrium between itself, hydrogen ions, and hydroxide ions. And again, water dissociates to a small degree on its own, so you will always have a few of these floating around and a few of these floating around. And what you see on the right here, this is the pH scale. And uh, for the most part, for our purposes, we say it goes from 0 to 14. And you can see that the acidic side here is the low number. So from 7 on down, we see the acids. Um, on the other hand, bases are going to be at the other end. So we say that they have a high pH. So they take up the numbers higher than 7, 7 to 14. And if you are a neutral solution, then you wind up having a pH right around 7. And that would be um, equal concentrations of hydrogen and hydroxide ions in a solution would be a neutral solution. So um, what we said then, um, and this is kind of... Um, uh, kind of confusing to hear, but when you have a high concentration of H plus ions, we said you're more acidic. So the higher the H plus, the lower the number of pH. And that's what a lot of students have trouble grasping. How can you have high of something and it results in a low number? Well, in the case of pH, they're inversely proportional. So when H goes up, pH goes down. And what we could also say is the reverse of that. So as H concentration goes down, the pH goes up. I know it's confusing, however, you just have to understand that it's an inversely proportional relationship without going too deep into the chemistry um, as we talk about pH and biology. Okay, I think this uh, diagram here makes it, does a really good job of showing you how that works. So in the case of uh, this first solution here in this red section, um, you can see some common substances over here that qualify as acids. We have battery acid, gastric juice, lemon juice, vinegar, beer, wine, cola, tomato juice, black coffee, rainwater, and urine. Those things have more hydrogen ions than they do hydroxide ions. You can even count them. So if I look at the H pluses, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of those versus two of the hydroxide. So there's more hydrogen ions than there are hydroxide ions, and that's characteristic of an acidic solution. Okay. If we look at our neutral solution where we see pure water, we see um, hydrogen versus hydroxide, one, two, three, four, five of the H pluses and one, two, three, four, five of the OH minuses. So what that means is that they are an equal concentration, H plus concentration equals OH minus concentration, and that is a neutral scenario for a solution. And at the bottom, of course, we have our basic solution here where the hydroxide far outnumber the hydrogen ions, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of the hydroxides, and we have one, two of the hydrogen. So by a seven to two ratio, hydroxide outnumber hydrogens, and that's characteristic of a basic solution. Uh, some of the bases that we see around us every day, seawater, milk of magnesia, household ammonia, bleach, oven cleaner. Um, so that is the other end of the spectrum of the pH scale. Okay, um, there's some simple tests that we can do very quickly to find out if something is acidic or basic. The simplest of all is the litmus test. Um, litmus comes from a, a lichen that changes color um, in response to whether it's in contact with an acidic or basic solution. Uh, so on this special type of paper, acids will turn litmus paper uh, to a red color and bases will turn litmus paper to a bluish color. 
So if you're doing a quick check of pH in a solution, you can just dip the paper in. You very quickly see that uh, you get a response of whether you're dealing with an acid or a base. Of course, now that technology has come a long way, not only do we have universal pH paper that goes through a rainbow of colors telling you exactly which number it's at, we also have digital uh, pH me meters and readers that go to the hundredth place for any of these numbers, which gives you a far better detail on the level of acid or base that you're dealing with. Um, last thing I wanted to mention here as we look at the uh, pH scale here, at least on this slide, is that um, we have, uh, for example, if you go up one unit, if you go from four to five on the pH scale, what that means is that the five pH is 10 times less acidic than the four. Every time you move up in, in or down this scale here, it's a factor of 10. So I could say if I was looking at a pH three solution, and to the next uh, to the side of it I had a pH one solution. This pH one is not ten times, but it's ten times ten uh, times of a lower pH. So it's a hundred times stronger acid, um, hundred times lower um, technically than the three that you're dealing with. So um, the hydrogen ions move very quickly up and down the scale because each number is, goes by a factor of ten. Um, the last idea that we're going to talk about, at least for our objectives here, is what a buffer is. So our human pH inside of us is 7.4. Okay, So what that means is we have to stay around 7.4 to stay healthy. Now there's a little bit of sway in there, maybe 7.35, 7.45, but you really don't want it getting out of that range. If it does, bad things happen medically. Um, so what we need is we got to have the ability to regulate pH and not have it go up or down um, in a significant uh, way um, within the chemistry of our body. So we have a buffer system in play and a buffer is a chemical that absorbs excess, excess acids and bases that are added to the solution. Because again, I don't want my pH dropping from 7.4 to 5.4, or um, I probably would die very, very quickly. I need to have it around 7.4 all the time. Regardless of what I eat or drink, I want it to stay relatively stable. Um, so that's what buffers are gonna do. They're gonna provide stability so that 7.4 reading here doesn't go very far from this level. And uh, you can keep adding acids and keep adding acids, and it's going to tend to stick around that particular level. In our case, it's 7.4. Same thing with bases. If bases are introduced in the system, you're not going to see a lot of change going on versus an unbuffered solution. If I start dripping hydrochloric acid into an unbuffered solution, we're going to see that the solution changes pH very, very quickly. It's going to go lower in number fast. Now, buffers do have limits though. You can overload a buffer system, use up all the buffer, and then you would see a drop like that, a very precipitous drop in pH um, versus, um, I'm sorry, if you overload a buffer. If you put, there's just too much acid or too much base in the system, you'll see a sudden drop. And then of course, you know, an organism would be in serious trouble. So buffers can be used up. So um, that completes our talk for today. Um, I hope you understand the idea of water and its importance a little bit better uh, than you did before. And um, next time we're going to be talking about biomolecules. I'll see you then. <laughs>